Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Darius Kazemi, and I'm from Portland, Oregon, on the west coast of the United States. And I'll warn you right now, I'm pretty jet lagged, but I'm also extremely grateful to be invited out here by the conference. I've been excited about this trip for months now, and I was going to talk about creativity and coding, which is usually what I talk about at a conference like this. But uh, then something happened. Um, excuse me. Two weeks ago today, Donald Trump was elected president of the United States of America. Many people around the world are afraid for what the future holds. I'm a bisexual Iranian-American US citizen, and I'm afraid of what the future holds for me. And yet I'm here on this stage in Stockholm at the internet days, and now I have to say something to you all about the internet. I was invited here because I make art that's about the internet and that lives on the internet. Unlike the physical robots Daniela mentioned earlier, I make autonomous software robots that perform art. One of my earlier creations is the Random Shopper, a bot I made in 2012. Every month, I gave it a $50 Amazon gift card, and once a month, it would pull random dictionary words, search Amazon for those words, and do its best to buy a bunch of random crap that it then shipped to me. <laughs> uh, as you can see, the first shipment contained a book about linguistics by Noam Chomsky. Uh, and a CD of electroacoustic music by the avant-garde Swedish-Hungarian composer Akash Rosman. Uh, in the end, it felt like I had an alien from Mars as my own personal shopper, and Amazon slowly built its own profile of the bot uh, as a Presbyterian science fiction and film enthusiast. I've also made other projects. Uh, one of them is called Leaving Everywhere. It's a generator that pulls real data from the United States Census Bureau and generates a tearful goodbye letter about why life is bad in one random city and why the author is moving to another random city. Uh, there's a few examples here, and I'm just gonna read uh, a little bit from one. Why I'm leaving Chicago, Illinois. Chicago, I love you, but you're bringing me down. I'm seeking a more sustainable lifestyle in Tacoma, Washington. Of course, Chicago has much to offer. My longtime data entry keyer, Miranda, the neighbor, the maxillofascial surgeon, Devin, the islands, the college auditoriums, the parades. When this town is good, it's great. However, something was rubbing me the wrong way about this place, so I decided to do a little research. Did you know that the average monthly housing expense for a homeowner with a mortgage is $1,933? And according to the 2013 American Community Survey conducted by the US Census Bureau, the number of Asian people living in poverty is 29,854. Can you believe it? Also, did you know we have 40,202 women working in personal care here? What the hell? Not that there's anything wrong with that Chicago. For example, the average value of an, owner, of an owner occupied home is $233,200. This is something everyone can aspire to. Another bot I've made is two headlines. This takes, lives on Twitter, and it takes subjects from Google News and swaps them between headlines, tweeting the results. This town has resisted pelicans for 18 months, but food is running low. <laughs> Donald Trump joins cast of Game of Thrones. Five things you should know about San Francisco as a service. And the exceedingly ominous, humans to restart by May 15th. The bots I make are deliberately playful. They play with words, they play with expectations, and they play with the forms of communication that are popular on the internet. They are algorithms that are designed to delight people and to provoke thought. But there are other algorithms out there. While Donald Trump is on the precipice of inheriting the most complex surveillance apparatus in the history of the world, we have recent news of Shanghai-based researchers who published a paper 
where they use artificial intelligence to predict the future criminal behavior of a person by measuring different aspects of their face. The researchers looked at several hundred faces of both criminals and non-criminals, mostly Chinese men in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. They gave the images to a convolutional neural network, the same kind of image classifier that you may have played with online that can guess your age or tell you a, what a breed of dog is. The image classifier discovered its own set of distinguishing facial features that correlated 95% correctly to a list of never-before-seen images of people known to be law-abiding or to be criminals. This might sound familiar to you as the 19th century concept of phrenology, a pseudoscience closely related to the eugenics movement that posited that certain social behaviors correlated to facial features, particularly on the head, the face, and maybe some other parts of the body. For example, if you had a bump over your right ear, a phrenologist might say that you were a destructive person. These readings were used as a justification for prejudice against many different ethnic groups, including blacks, Slavs, and Jews. In the case of both classic phrenology and this new artificial intelligence-driven kind, there is an elision of correlation with causation. These classifications put blind faith in institutions, assuming that the institutions are correct, not only in who they convict of crimes, but also in who they do not convict. Just because someone is in prison doesn't mean they've committed a crime, especially under a government like China's. Someone may be a law-abiding citizen, and as far as, the police, as far as the police know, but they might be committing domestic abuse at home. Yet their face appears in the law-abiding category, which is what the algorithm is trained on. The only thing this new kind of phrenology tells us is the same thing the old style of phrenology told us. They both highlight the existing power structures by codifying their biases into something that possesses the unimpeachable authority of science. Compare this to another project of mine, the sorting bot. The sorting bot is a Twitter version of the sorting hat from Harry Potter. If you follow the bot on Twitter, it assigns you to a Hogwarts house with a rhyme. You stand before the sorting hat, my real estate is iced. For Slytherin, you cast your lot, for you are underpriced. The ethic of a porcupine, the wisdom of a, of a goose, in Ravenclaw is where you go, for you are quite abstruse. There's a very important design decision at the core of Sorting Bot. Oh, excuse me. Um, there we go. There's a very important decision at the core of Sorting Bot. It assigns you to a house arbitrarily. People sometimes assume that it's doing sentiment analysis on your tweets. They come up with conspiracy theories. Maybe because you say a lot of curse words, it puts you in Slytherin. Or maybe because if you link to Wikipedia a lot, you're Ravenclaw. The bot is actually 100% arbitrary, but people cannot imagine an internet without surveillance. It's Astonishing to me. The sorting bot very intentionally de-emphasizes the house selection in favor of the fun of these custom nursery rhymes. This is an algorithm that is not designed to use your identity. It doesn't make any presumptions about who you are. It does not infer things about your behavior from generic markers that you leave online. It does not surveil by design. Phrenology looks at passive physical markers, things that we cannot control, and makes inferences about who we are. The sorting bot is the opposite of this. It is not enough to critique the things that we think are bad. I believe we have to fill the world with things that we think are good. And to me, the sorting bot is one attempt that I've made at doing that. The French social scientist Bruno Latour wrote a book in 1993 called Aramis, or The Love of Technology. 
It's a chronicle of the failed attempt to create a personal rapid transit system in Paris in the 1970s and 80s. Imagine something like uh, a driverless uh, car system, uh, but with technology from 40 years ago. It was, it was an incredibly ambitious project and one that never came to fruition. The book is a kind of post-mortem of the project, interviews with the engineers who put it together and the managers and uh, all sorts of other people involved in the project. And as part of the book, he postulates that the job of any team engaged in any kind of engineering or design is to transform fiction into reality. By definition, he says, a technological project is a fiction, since at the outset it does not exist, and there is no way it can exist yet because it is in the project phase. Design and engineering is the painstaking process of coaxing fiction, little by little, into nonfiction. Latour goes so far to say that at the, at the beginning of a project, there is not that great a distinction even between ideas and concrete objects. We, the people in this room, are the designers and engineers of the internet. This immense responsibility is something we could do amazing things with, and yet, for so many of us, uh, the fictions we choose to create and invite into reality look like this. Facebook would like to hear from you. Which brand do you associate most with swing states in the 2016 election? Select an option. Bacardi, Malibu, Captain Morgan, Bud Light, or other slash none. Now I get it. You've got to make money. You've got to earn a living. But here's the problem. If we create bleak and awful things today, then the future is bleak and awful. And if the future is bleak and awful enough, making a living might be impossible. Here's a chart of Facebook's revenue for the last three years, ending with their Q3 report from just before the election. They had their best quarter ever, seven point some billion dollars. They've been doing very well. Now here's that chart projected six months into the future if Donald Trump triggers a global thermal nuclear war. We don't want to end up like, oh, there we go. Sorry about that. We don't want to end up like this guy. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. So what do we, the people sitting in this room, do? I'm not going to tell you specifically what to do. Everyone in this room is smart and can figure out specific actions for themselves. But what I can tell you about is a set of questions that I ask myself at least once a day. I've found these questions helpful in guiding my work as a technologist and ensuring that I'm living a life that creates sorting bots instead of AI phrenology. What kind of world do I want to live in? This is not the question, what kind of life do I want to live? That's an easy question. You can always just imagine yourself rich and not having to work and only ever hanging out with attractive and funny and intelligent people or whatever it is that you want your life to look like. That's a simple thing to imagine. One of the things that bothers me most is people who work with technology who lack imagination. And I'm not talking about technological imagination, of course. Everyone can say, oh, let's make a new JavaScript framework that has server-side rendering. It'll be great, and we'll take this piece from this and that piece from that, and we'll, we'll put it on GitHub. Um, I'm talking about social imagination, the ability to look at the world and to look at what you can do and make connections between these things. Really take some time and imagine this world. Look at science fiction, look at history. Look around you today. Just make things up off the top of your head. This is an exercise in fiction writing, and you are writing your future. Next question is sort of a two-parter. It's who can I serve and how am I equipped to serve them? I want to take a brief detour to talk about two concepts from religious studies that I find helpful to think about uh, all the time. 
Uh, these are the ideas of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. In religious studies, orthodoxy is used to describe a religion that is centered on belief and ritual. In an orthodoxic religion, people are bound together because they hold the same beliefs and they practice the same rituals. In an orthopraxic religion, what binds people together is that they carry out the same actions in the real world. Belief is secondary to action. And in my opinion, it's easy to be orthodoxic and hold beliefs that let you think that you're a good person. An orthopraxic outlook is what's needed to change the world. And for me, the most important praxis is service. Everyone in this room is a technologist, and I mean everyone in the broadest sense. Everybody who works in technology is a technologist, even marketers and office managers and other positions that aren't traditionally considered engineering or design. And as technologists, we are in a unique position to serve others through technology. If you are a marketer or even an office manager or something like that, you are helping develop this fiction that is that being brought into reality. Now, maybe that fiction that you're imagining boils down to optimizing advertising revenue. Look in the mirror in the morning and ask yourself how this is serving others. I'm going to guess that it's probably not good enough. You might come up with a justification like, well, the money I make at this job, I can give some of it to charity, and that helps people, so that's how I'm serving. I don't think that's good enough. Something I've learned is that the way you serve people is by dedicating most of your time to serving, making it the primary part of your daily experience. As humans, we can only prioritize one or two things at a time in our lives, and it's very easy for capitalism to grind us down to a place where we don't have energy for anything else. So I'm saying you should prioritize service. And the last question is, who can I join forces with to create the world I want to live in? You can't do this alone. You need allies. You need to find other people who share your vision. Other people are also a good forcing function. For, uh, for example, interacting with people usually means your ideas will be challenged. You'll never find someone who shares your vision for the world 100% ever. It's impossible, but that's okay. Find someone who shares it 50%, 60%, and join up with them. Two people out there in the world working to make a compromise change is far better than one person with no help who sits in their bedroom but retains ideological purity. I need to remind myself of these questions to make sure that I stay sane and that I'm able to live with myself. I promise you that every day, I'm going to ask these questions in the mirror when I wake up and before I go to bed. These are scary times in Europe and in the United States and in the rest of the world. As we go into the days ahead, we're going to need each other more than ever. I invite you to use these questions to think about your role as a technologist, to realize that being in this room puts you in a position of power, and to use that power to imagine wonderful fictional futures and bring them kicking and screaming into the present. I wanna give special thanks to my spouse, Courtney Stanton, for their help with this presentation, and I wanna thank you all, and please enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks. Thank oh, you. Please sure. stay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we've seen uh, we've seen some physical bots, and now we've talked about some uh, of the software kind that you work on. Also, I take with uh, your speech that t towards the end there, who do you serve? Who are, who are you working for? Do we need something more like a church of the internet? It almost sounds like you're a preacher telling us to you know, work towards the common good, to, work, to, to aspire to a higher aim, rather than to do what's good for capitalism, what's good for the now. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure I would say we need a church specifically, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I do think we need to make moral decisions. Beyond even ethics, I think we need to think about morality and the world that we live in. And um, 
Uh, I think this is uh, uh, sorely lacking from uh, computer science education. Um, I think uh, this is something that everybody really needs to think about because this is, you know, this is this is power. We have real power, and I think we have to approach that with uh, with a great amount of responsibility and even uh, trepidation. I agree. What, what do you think about Facebook, Google, Apple, and these huge tech giants and how they are working with their moral compass towards building a better society? I mean, we have Google, do no evil. <laughs> what do you think? What, what are your thoughts? Where are they going right? Where are they going wrong? I mean, I think uh, I would have believed their do no evil uh, back in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, I think once you become a public company and you become uh, a giant uh, organization with a you know billion, trillion dollar market cap, uh, it becomes uh, impossible to do that sort of thing as an organization. Uh, so I'm actually very skeptical of, of large organizations. You would think as an artist that it's impossible to serve uh, the cult of money at the same time as the moral compass of creating a, a, a good society. Uh, yeah, I would go so far as to say that. Yeah. Thank you. We have, of course, the physical robot for you as well. <laughs> and uh, Thank you. Maybe this one comes with an Arduino. Maybe you can fill it, fill it with your own yeah. uh, moral code to make it work <laughs> towards I'll, common good. I'll install a moral compass on this. Yeah, thank you so that. much, and thank you for thank an inspiring you. talk. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>